Welcome back to the Indian Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Raj Bakaran. More importantly, you, you are looking for living wisdom that you can apply to your everyday life. And this is what you will receive, a very profound encapsulation of power, of two types of power. Today we'll tell the tale of two figures, Vasishta and Vishwamitra, and the ways in which their drama, their saga encode the interplay of outer and inner power. They are sovereign and they are sage. They encapsulate the interplay between the sacred and the secular, the social and the spiritual. And without question, this is relevant to anyone who is wanting to be in the world, but not of the world, anyone who's looking to spiritualize, to evolve spiritually, to awaken their consciousness while ensconced in mundane life, not enmeshed in it, (laughs) but fully engaged in it. Once upon a time, there was a king, a great and powerful king, an emperor indeed. His name was Vishwamitra. He took with him a great retinue, about a hundred or so, and went into the forest hunting. Now, while in the forest, he came across an ashrama, an ashrama hermitage, where dwelt the forest-dwelling sage Vasishta, best of sages. Vasishta was actually one of the original seven sages of ancient India. He was actually the son of Brahma, the creator himself. He was the greatest and best of sages, versed in Vedic learning, as well as advanced in spiritual attainment. He had perfected the virtues of humility, nonviolence, forgiveness, restraint, compassion, etc. Beyond being an ascetic adept, He was also best of Brahmins, a high priest, and well-versed in social etiquette as well. He understood very clearly the crucial interplay between Brahmanas and Kshatriyas, Brahmanas as holders of spiritual knowledge, and Kshatriyas, warriors, administrators, rulers, holders of social office. Embodying the ancient Sanskrit dictum, the guest is God, Vasishta, best of sages, graciously greeted the mighty king, shining like the midday sun, by the power of his tapas, by the power of his ascetic practices. The humble sage offered to water and feed the ruler and his entire retinue. Vishwamitra graciously accepted, not wanting to offend the sage, but not expecting much, for after all, he was, of course, a modest sage living in a modest abode, a single hut, in the middle of the woods, befitting one ensconced in a life of devotion and contemplation and tutelage of students, etc., etc. You know, it would be a real feat to feed such a retinue, even for the royal kitchens, (laughs) much less the modest setting of this single forest-dwelling sage. After taking a bit of time, To make the necessary preparation, the Brahmin sage invited the king and his royal retinue into the hermitage. To the utter astonishment of all, the guests were greeted with an array of sumptuous cuisine, luscious fare, epic food and drink, a feast for a king indeed. (laughs) Mouth-watering dish after dish were served in lavish style and all ate their fill. When they were finished, Vishwamitra expresses gratitude, to which Vasishta replied quite wisely, Mighty king, devouring food is akin to the sacred fire sacrifice, that sacred fire which devours our offerings. Such is your internal fire, your agni seated in your stomach, in your Manipura chakra. So, The sacrifice of hospitality is offered into the internal fires, just as my sacrifice of oblations are offered into the sacred ritual fire. So I'm delighted that you are well sated. My sacrifice has been accepted. The king was sated in a certain sense, but in another sense he was not. His curiosity overcame him, his intrigue. He hungered for information. 
Surely a man of your, of your spiritual status, of your stature, great Vasishta, surely you live modestly. Where else do you acquire your tapas through self-restraint? And yet it seems your hermitage is stocked with the finest of foods and lavish supply. How could this be? Great king, responded the sage, you are right. I live humbly in the material world. My riches are spiritual indeed. But just out back behind my hermitage dwells Shabala, also known as Kamadeno, the great wish-fulfilling cow. You know, the same which was churned by the celestial oceans, you know, when the demons and gods churned in search of the elixir. The poison came first, which Shiva neutralized in his throat, and riches after riches after riches emerged, until at last the elixir was procured. And one such extraordinary spoil of the churning was Shabala, the wish-fulfilling cow, abiding out back in my care. You know, in exchange for taking care of her spiritually, she provides for my needs. Now, the king had heard the legend of Shabala, the wish-fulfilling cow, thinking it only a tale a tale to be told to children, not realizing that she was quite real. And not only was she real, she was within his own realm. My goodness. Powerful temptation arose in him. Have you ever been tempted by some stimulus of some kind? <laughs> what tempts you more than other things? Perhaps your temptations are different from your friends. Perhaps... Some of you are tempted by drink, others not so much. Perhaps you'll happily accompany your friend to the casino where they are tempted by the gambling and you are not so much tempted by the gambling and you drink for free. <laughs> Perhaps you're both tempted by chocolate cake or not, etc., etc., etc. This vasana, it is this, this pattern, this powerful temptation arose in the king his eyes glazed over as Gollum before the ring. <laughs> he fantasized. Hmm, fantasy has come. He fantasized about what he could do with a wish-fulfilling cow. The might of the one who could possess such a creature. Visions of endless finery, weapons, riches, and treasures began to fill his mind. And although physically full, he began to salivate anew. <laughs> Gratitude was gone. And devoured by the black hole of the shadow, his desires were casting upon the situation. The soul is a light source, and the ego is an object. And every object before light source casts a shadow. The larger the ego, the larger the shadow. And some shadows are so large, they eclipse just about every situation. Yes. Gratitude was eclipsed. Humility was eclipsed. Decency, you know, on the verge of collapse. <laughs> eclipsed by insatiable appetite, greed, and pride. So compelled. It's compulsive behaviors, yes. We don't choose our compulsions, do we? <laughs> Compelled by these patterns, the king addressed the sage thus. Why would so powerful a creature belong to so lowly a forest ascetic, O Brahmin? He sneered. Technically, do I not possess all that rests within my realm? And so is the cow abiding in my realm not technically mine? I therefore command you to hand her over to me immediately. Mighty king, he did the sage, you misunderstand. The cow does not belong to me, or anyone for that matter. Neither is the sun, nor moon, nor stars. Like them, she is free. She is part of creation. She was merely placed in my care. It is my divine rituals, my spiritual power which nourishes her. She's not an ordinary cow. She imbibes spiritual nourishment. 
and she provides for my needs in return. My needs are generally modest, you see. But in the moment of your arrival, I quite literally needed a feast in order to offer hospitality befitting of your stature. And that could sate your entire entourage. And so she provided this feat for me. It was a need in the moment. She's not mine to give. She's free. She's her own agent. And beyond that, where would she go? How could she thrive without my spiritual care? You dare refuse your king? No doubt you wish to keep her for yourself. It's interesting when people have a, a nasty habit or two, they, <laughs> they typically assume <laughs> that others are like-minded. Similarly, even when we're kind, we assume that others are similar. You know, We make the fallacy of assuming that folks are like us rather than see the entire spectrum of the human experience. <laughs> How dare you who's your king? You want to keep her for yourself. I don't need your consent to take her. You stand no chance against me nor my powerful forces. Go fetch her now. Despondent, dismayed, the sage went off to fetch, to fetch the wish-fulfilling cow, hunched over with resignation, beaten into submission, as it were, his spirit broken. He was deferring to the authority, the power of the king. What kind of power is this? How many of you have been in situations where others have oppressed you? Whether they were technically your superior in a social sense or not. Mind you, spiritually, there is no superior. <laughs> there is one soul that we all share. But, you know, he was deferring to the authority of the king. So he goes over to his beloved Shabala and explains the situation. Says, you know, what can I do to com comply? I'm no match for the king, much less his army. Who are now very strong and well fed, thanks to your grace. What can I do? Lamented Vasishta. He is a great emperor, and I a lowly hermit. He has the power here. So I must part with you, my dear Shabala. Shabala's ears perked up. Her tail twitched. There was an indignant scowl upon her lips. Mad cow indeed. <laughs> As she thus replied to Vasishta, best of sages. Brahmin sage, hear my counsel, declared the cosmic cow. The king possesses no true power. For his is merely bestowed by his army and his subjects. Political power is moored in the outer world, in this which decays. But ours is the power of the gods. Divine, divine power emerges from the eternal, the real, the true. The sage is far more powerful than the sovereign. Great sage, know you not the power that you possess? Yours is the power of the gods. It is by your divine power that I am nourished here, lest I perish. The king has only false power, an outer show, born of stealing the power of others. Own your power, Lord Sage. Give the command, and I will destroy the pride of this wicked so-called king. Just wish it so, O oh mighty man, and I shall use this divine power to crush the pride of this wicked man. Heeding the wisdom of the cosmic cow, the sage with a twinkle in his eye, rejuvenated by her counsel, commanded the cow to slaughter the pride of the sovereign. <laughs> the sage led the cow to the king, but the king could not budge her, nor could any of his entourage. They all tried together, and she would not move an inch. His entire retinue was no match for the poise of the single cosmic cow. Vishwamitra left the hermitage, tail between his legs, his pride crushed. That was, after all, her goal, to teach him a lesson. Sometimes people learn lessons relatively easily, and sometimes, you know, it takes a little knock on the head. Sometimes it takes driving over a cliff, you know. <laughs> you know, the, the universe typically whispers at first, and, you know, sometimes it needs to shout in your ear. Anyhow, Shabala ends up defeating Vishwamitra's army. But Vishwamitra is a king, a proud man, who's determined to defeat the sage. And he was determined 
to own that cow. <laughs> so what does he do? He consecrates his heir as king of his kingdom and takes, he retires to the forest to undertake penance. He's looking for a blessing. He undertakes penance to Lord Shiva, the great Lord of Yogis. After worshipping him day in and day out for a great many years, Shiva appears and offers Darshana a vision of himself before the king and says, you know, I, I will grant you a boon, a wish of your choosing. And the king, you know, read enough Puranic tales and heard enough podcasts to know that you can't wish for mortality and you can't wish for, you know, within reason. Typical, you can't wish for more wishes, etc., etc. So Vishwamitra, the king, says, Great Shiva, you are the greatest of all gods, Mahadeva. Surely you know the ways of strength. As you no doubt perceive through your third eye my plight, you know my enemy, and you know the obstacle before me. My forces were insufficient to contend with Vasishta's cow. So, great Lord, I wish for my forces to be multiplied. Increase my army a thousandfold and make my warriors indefatigable of inexhaustible strength. Shiva, smiling, ever smiling, mysteriously smiling, granted the boon to Vishwamitra, the king. You shall attain the power you seek, King Vishwamitra. Your forces will be increased a thousandfold and be populated by men of unlimited stamina. Tadastu, so be it. Then the blue-throated lord vanished. Vishwamitra was delighted having received his wish. And, accompanied by his martial hordes, he descended again upon the Ashrafa, upon the hermitage of Vasishta, intending to storm it and steal Shabala away from himself. He was, after all, humiliated by his first encounter, but he was intent on possessing the cow of plenty. And so he returns with an army of 10,000 men, complete with horses, chariots, elephants, and weapons of all manner. Sensing the army's approach, when the sage was sensing his approach, the sage scurried out back, he hustled out back to rouse Shabala into action to, of course, defend the ashram. You know, he, he blurted out what he was sensing, that, <laughs> that the great monarch Vishwamitra was returning with uh, greater forces than ever before. And he urged her to go forth and defend the ashram. The cow took a deep breath, maybe chewed a bit of its cud, and said, Lord Sage, I will do no such thing. What? said Vasishta, panicking somewhat, somewhat alarmed. What do you mean, dear Shabala? Is all now lost? Will we not be able to defend the ashram? against this rogue king and his army? Shabala replied, Of course we will, great sage, but by your own hand, not mine. Have you not been listening? Is this thing on? You possess divine power within you, power which comes from the gods, Shakti. Spiritual power is far greater than martial power. Don't you know this? Does Kundalini Shakti the spiritual power, not course through your subtle spine. You don't need to develop a backbone. You already have one, a sacred one at that. So go use it. Straighten yourself up, man, and go defend your ashram. <laughs> the sage was energized by the words of the cow and filled with righteous wrath. Vasishta went out to meet the oncoming army at the gate of his ashram. He had nothing more with him than his yogic staff, but he, stole he stood tall and faced Vishamitra as he arrived at the head of his army. Standing confidently at the end of his formidable army, the puffed-up king commanded, Come forth and face me, you cowardly sage. You are about to learn what power wields a king. Feeble sage, he continued. You think your little cow can withstand the strength of 10,000 men? Before the day is out, I will have her squealing like a pig in meek surrender. 
then she will see that her rightful place is by the side of a powerful of a powerful king such as moi et as moi. <laughs> the sage approached, contented, a blaze shining like the midday sun, completely luminous with the energy of his spiritual practices. He recalled how disempowered he felt when the king was last there and how willing he was to give his power away to this tyrannical man. He recalled the wise counsel of his beloved cow, nourished by the divine power of his sacred rituals. The cow had counseled that while a king wields outer social power, a sage wields divine inner power, one sacred, one secular, perhaps. The king's power is born of time and circumstance, and time ravishes even entire empires, such as the rise and fall of kings. But the sage's power is imperishable. Realizing this, remembering this, embodying this wisdom, the sage stood resolute and faced the king, standing up straight with a staff at his side. The sage declared, I do not need my dear Shabala's help. It is by my divine power that she is nourished. And it shall be by that very power that you and this great army are defeated. Behold, I stand before you ready to face you and your army. My fear has been dispelled by discernment. Where there is wisdom, there is no fear. And where there is fear, there is no wisdom. I see clearly now who is more powerful. Let us test the might of your army, shall we? There could be no comparison between mere martial might of an earthly king and the colossal cosmic power of a Brahminous age. Behold, as I smite you with the power of the gods. The king laughed in Vasishya's face, disbelieving that the sage could accomplish any such feat. With this, Vasishya raised his hermit staff to the heavens and was filled with the divine power of the gods, emitting bolts of lightning. He centered himself and summoned all of his inner strength he could muster to wield that divine power. When he was ready, with a single flick of his yogic staff, bolts of energy issued forth. Vishwamitra's forces were all stunned and fell to the ground. The horses and elephants bolted, maddened by the might of Vashista's power. By wielding the divine power, the sage annihilated the king's vast forces with a single stroke of his staff. He then turned his staff to the flabbergasted Vishwamitra and flicked it once again. A bolt of shakti of energy knocked the king off his horse, off his high horse, as it were, and brought him to his knees. Vasishta went over to Vishwamitra. Standing over him, he uttered these words. The duty of social secular power is to protect spiritual power. It is spiritual power whereby kings are consecrated. When social rulers and politicians, when kings fail to do so, they have regard for higher forces. The gods themselves intervene. The power of a king is brittle, your highness, born of armies and pomp and circumstance. But the divine power of the sage is eternal and far outlives the petty rise and fall of kings. Vishwamitra retreated, astonished, uh, disoriented, bewildered, even afraid, utterly demoralized. He retreated twice now. He had been brought to his knees by the sage and his cow with a clouded Bewildered mind, he turned once again to pen once again to penance, penance to the mighty Shiva. He sat in lotus posture, focused his mind on Shiva's divine form, and chanted Shiva's sacred syllables, his mantra. He went forth, he went without food and water, and focused only on the Lord. This great penance lasted decades and centuries, indeed a thousand years. The Lord of Yogis appeared then before him with a knowing smile, pleased by his devotion. And Shiva asked, Well, great emperor, since the forces with which I blessed you were last were insufficient to combat the sage, I suppose you now seek an even greater number of forces with which to overcome him? Perhaps a thousand times? And perhaps with greater size and strength? But this time the king had been changed by his experiences and his thousand years of contemplation and meditation and reflection. 
He bowed before the Lord and said, Great Shiva, Lord of yogis, I now know that weapons of this world are no match for yogic power, for spiritual power. For might is material, divinity everlasting. That the issue, you see, that the, the problem in my confrontation with the great sage Vasishta was not in the quantity of my forces, but in their quality. Through my centuries of meditations upon your divine form, I realize that your own great power comes from within and not without. I no longer wish to conquer Vasishta. I no longer wish to conquer anyone for that matter. So much of my life, my attention was ensconced in the outer. No, 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 no. It's the wrong direction. I wish to cultivate and establish my inwardness. Rather than conquer anyone, I wish to learn how to conquer myself. My wish is to become a Brahmin sage myself. I wish to know true power. Grant me the divine insight needed to purify my ego and learn life's mysteries. Grant me the power of a sage, great Lord. For this, I sacrifice all of my earthly riches and my status. Sensing Vishwamitra's sincerity, Shiva granted this most precious of boons. For the first, and perhaps last time in history, a king was transformed into a Brahmin sage. There's so, so, so much here if you, if you know how to listen and apply this to your own life and understand that you are a sage and you are a king. You have an outer dimension, you have an inner dimension, right? Put it to Indic philosophy, actually, the school of Sankhya, one of the six darshanas. Um, it's so prevalent, um, a school of thought that most other schools um, imbibe its wisdom. That is the wisdom of the three gunas, this theorization that all creation, all of reality, all that we experience is made up of three overarching modes, gunas. And those modes are sattva, the mode of goodness, lightness, clarity. When you're of sattvic mind, then virtue and wisdom are readily available to you. The mode of rajas, passion, drive, energy, desire, you can say. And the mode of tamas, heaviness, darkness, inertia, ignorance. So this is not just applicable to innate things, but this is particularly applicable to consciousness itself and modes of consciousness and the ways in which material creation condition consciousness, filter consciousness. Right? Vasishta is a Brahmin sage, so he's typically ensconced in the mode of sattva, purity, lightness, goodness, clarity. Yes. Vishamitra, however, being a king, he's typically ensconced in rajas, passion, drive, desire. However, they each have lessons to learn. The sage learns that there is a time for war, there is a time for battle. There is time to protect what's yours, particularly when those who are supposed to be protecting you are failing. And most importantly, the Emperor, the king, Vishwamitra, learns the power of sattva, the power of sagacity, the power of wisdom, the power of clear seeing, the power of spiritual evolution, self-realization. Right. These two, these two characters, they represent crucial aspects of the human experience, crucial aspects of you and your life. Right, the, the sage represents your capacity to learn and discern and know and grow wise in time, not just grow old. <laughs> Perhaps he represents your inner life and all of the wish fulfilling that such divine power can yield you. The king, on the other hand, represents our command of the outer life, our ability to rise through the ranks and wield social power, status. He has our drive to possess and to be more than we are, particularly in the outer world, particularly in relationships with others. First impulse is sattva, sattvic, prioritizes the spiritual. The second is rajas, it prioritizes the social. And you are wise to find a way to dovetail the two, but not allow your social navigation to eclipse your spiritual aspiration. 
allow your spiritual aspiration to illumine your social navigation. This is the trick. It's a bit of a balancing act. <laughs> these stories are told for the poses named after these sages, and they're both very difficult balancing acts, these poses, because this state of consciousness uh, that is mythologized by the encounter of sovereign and sage, of Vishwamit and Vasishta, this state of consciousness, perhaps what the Bhagavad Gita calls Nishkam Karma Yoga, desireless action, acting with bereft of rajas. This is a very difficult and profound and evolved balancing act. So perhaps you can reflect on this tale and reflect on which character or vignette or aspect you most identify with in your life journey at present. Where is the wisdom in here for you? Who do you need to learn to be more like and why? <laughs> Well, this is the tale of Sovereign and the Sage, the interplay of uh, the sacred and the secular, uh, the spiritual and the, the, the social, the inner and the outer. These two modes, these two sides of the coin of the human experience. I hope you've enjoyed this tale a fraction as much as its teller has enjoyed sharing it with you. And I most earnestly hope that you find a way to apply it, to embody its wisdom for your own benefit. Keep well until next time. Keep listening. Come study with me at the Indian Wisdom School. Perhaps even come, let's study in person at an in-person retreat. I'm not hard to find. By all means, reach out if I can be of service. Take good care. Namaste. Namaste.